Good morning. From all of us here at La Crescenta Presbyterian Church, welcome to our online worship service. We hope your spirit will be lifted, drawing closer to God this hour as we sing his praise, listen to the reading of his word, and receive instruction in the paths of righteousness. Let's come into his presence now with singing. Welcome to today's service. Here are some of the events coming up at La Crescenta Presbyterian Church. 
Registration for Jerusalem Marketplace Vacation Bible School is open. Visit the church office or the Children's Ministries page of our website to register your children for this great week of exciting activities, stories, crafts, and much more. VBS runs from July 11th through July 15th. Additionally, volunteers are still needed for the VBS team. If you have any interest in joining our volunteer team, whether it's volunteering for the whole week, a few days in the week, or even just helping us set up, please come see me at the VBS table after service or email me at josiah at lcpc.net. We would love the help. All right, that's all I've got for you today. Have a blessed rest of the service.
Our first scripture reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son who you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The word of God. We are reminded again and again that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. Uh, he is also there to hear our confession and to forgive us of our sins. So let's join together in prayer. Merciful God, you pardon all who truly repent and turn to you. We humbly confess our sins and ask your mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, our God. Have mercy on us, O God, in your loving kindness. In your great compassion, cleanse us from our sin. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us with your bountiful spirit. And all God's people said together, Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning is from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 35. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? 
This is the Word of God. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you are our Heavenly Father. And Lord, we uh, thank you for our earthly fathers. Lord, we pray that you would help us hear the good news. And Lord, you, we pray that the good news would come not only in word, but in power, in the Holy Spirit, in full conviction. Amen. Well, today is Father's Day, if you're watching on Father's Day. Uh, this will go live on Father's Day. And uh, we are grateful for all of the people that God has put in our lives who are fathers. Some of those people are fathers who we're related to, right? We, we share half of their DNA. Uh, but many people in my life are fathers who are, are, are spiritual fathers, right? People who have shared their lives with me, uh, people who've guided me on the path uh, to follow Jesus. Right, and those people are important in our lives. And, and, and so today we wanna to celebrate all of those people, right? We wanna celebrate all the people that God has put in our lives to, to shape us and to mold us into, in, into the people that God has created us to be. Uh, but, but of course, some of you know that there are, there are people in your lives that have done the opposite. They've guided you away. Today we want to talk about this, our heavenly father, and we're going to give a, an example of an earthly father as well, who, and how that works. And to, you know, and, and as you're sort of preparing to open that tie or, or that, or now most people don't give their kid, their dad's ties anymore. That's a, sort of an old joke is if it were 1957, right? Dads don't generally wear ties anymore. Uh, but you do get, but now the, the, I think the next standard gift is like a cordless drill. I think dads get, I think more cordless drills are bought uh, this week than any other time of the year, right? It's just the, the cordless drills seem to be the thing that are flying off the shelves. We wanna talk about the greatest gift, God's love. And this love that we see, not just in God, but we see it as it, as it flows through other people. But I wanna to talk to you about a, a really what seems like a, a passage in the, in the Bible that is not about, it's the opposite of love, right? <laughs> it's where this father is called to sacrifice his son on an altar, right? And, and if you think about, well, what really, I mean, if you're a dad, Really, the one of the big things you just don't want your kid—you just don't want a, your kids to die. I mean, that—that's really like on your watch, right? You like kids are constantly running around, especially when they're little. They're you know you buy toys for them and you you do all these things for them, and they would rather play with broken glass. I don't know what it is. Like you could have the best toy in the history of toys, or a pile of broken glass, and children will almost without fail go towards the broken glass. Like I just felt as a dad, that was my job. I was just trying to keep the kids from you know, dying, from really from killing themselves and harming themselves, right? That felt like what it was like. And here in this story of a father that you read in Genesis 22, right? This, this story, the, I, Abraham has been called to not only, you know, to not protect his son, but he's actually called to physically harm and offer his son a, as an offering. And, and so this, this passage is one of those passages that is, it, as a kid, I read this passage, and even as a, when I got into, as an adult and started studying it in seminary, I, I, this passage was so familiar to me that I, I just never thought about it as a, as a really troubling story. And then as I got older, I was like, this is a troubling story. This is a difficult story that God would ask Abraham to offer his son as a burnt offering. Right, it's it, it just, it's, it's a terrible story because then when you have kids, of course, they, they, you know, your kids think, well, my dad loves God. Would, would, would my dad sacrifice me on an altar if God asked him to? And, and that's a big question, right? The, the big question is, is what's this all about? What is this story for? Why, are, why would this story be recorded and passed down to us, right? Why would God give us this story, this seemingly barbaric kind of story? But we begin by knowing, right, that this is only a test. Right, where we the the alert comes and it says, you know, alert. This is you know, this is just a test. Don't go crazy, right? The story tells us us right from the beginning that this is just a test, right? In Genesis twenty two, it says, sometime later, God tested Abraham, right? And and the word testing here, 
is not just that God wanted to tease him. It's not just the idea that God wanted to, uh, you know, sort of just to see, right? To play a game and say, let's see if Abraham will do whatever I ask him to do. I'll see if I can make this monkey dance, right? That's not, the, the word test here is the word that's used in the Psalms, right? In Psalm 26 and Psalm 139. It is the idea of this idea, this, this of not just testing, but refining, right? It, imagine you, you've got a, a you know, an object that you think is pure gold. Well, how do you test that, right? You have to put it in the fire, right? You have to refine it. You have to make sure. That's the idea is that God is testing Abraham. And, and it's not just so that God can find out some information, like God doesn't know. I, I'm not really sure what'll happen. Let's just see, right? It's not a, God's not doing some sort of grand experiment up there, right? He's like, well, here's my hypothesis. And once I, you know, let me create some sort of test and I'll uh, create an experiment and I'll see what the results are. That's not what's happening. The word testing here is this idea. It's like God is refining and purifying Abraham's faith. And it's as much for Abraham or more than it is for God, right? God, it's not that God just needs knowledge, right? God's not playing games up there, right? This, there's a purpose behind this and it is for Abraham, but it's not just for Abraham. We're gonna find out later that it's not just for Abraham, but that it's for the whole world. But we'll come back to that. So we begin by knowing that this is a test, but Abraham, however, doesn't know it's a test. We get let off the hook really early, right? The first sentence of the story, we're off the hook, right? We, we, we realize that God's not gonna go through with this because it's just a test. But Abraham doesn't know that. In the ancient Near East, child sacrifice, while not common, while it wasn't an everyday occurrence, right? It's like every parent sacrificed children to, you know, to their gods. It did happen, right? It did happen in the ancient Near East. In fact, their rules right, in the, in the Old Testament, rules in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, right, that, that forbid child sacrifice, right? Human sacrifice is forbidden in the Bible, right? But the problem is Abraham doesn't have the Bible because, well, the Bible hadn't been written yet, right? So Abraham, uh, the gods around the people uh, sometimes uh, uh, demand child sacrifice or demand human sacrifice. And so Abraham thinks, well, I mean, Yahweh is the God of the universe, so he can ask me for anything. And so he says to Abraham, he says, uh, he says, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and then go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. And so Abraham does it. He gets up. Um, and, and this story is told in a way that there's, there, there's deep emotion in the story. Right, and of course, this is more than a story, right? This is God's word to us. But, but it is a story and it's meant to, to elicit these, these feelings from us. It's meant to draw out feelings. Listen to the way he says it. He says, take now your son, your only one, the one you love, Isaac. Now, of course, we do know that Abraham actually has another son, right? We, we sort of skipped that story as we were moving through, but Abraham does have another son named Ishmael. Right? He, is not the ch he is not the child through whom the promise of God will go, but he, God has blessed this young man, Ishmael. Right? Um, but this is not the one. This is not the promise. Ishmael is not the promised son. Uh, right? A Abraham sort of uh, went kind of around God. God wasn't doing it on his timetable, so, God, so Abraham kind of made an end around, around God. But ultimately, right, Isaac becomes the son through whom the promise will flow. It, he, Isaac is the son that Abraham's gonna leave everything to. I mean, he's gonna take over the family business, right? That he's gonna be, right, Isaac will be the one through whom the blessing for the whole world goes. And listen to what he says, take your son, your only one, the one you love, Isaac, right? It, it, it almost feels as if God is like turning the knife, you know, like just, just so there's no confusion, right? It's your only, it's your son. Your only one, the one you love, Isaac, right? I don't want you to be confused, right? He, and, and you can feel the knife sort of turning in there. And it, it, it's, it's painful because it's not just that Abraham loves Isaac. And of course he does, right? He, he loves his son, right? His, and, but it's more than that. In the ancient Near East, 
uh, in those cultures, children were not just a, they weren't just a piece of you that would live forever, right? It, they provided stability for you in your old age. They were, uh, you found meaning and purpose in having children, uh, especially fathers and sons. They, there is, the, to give up Isaac would have been this thing that most of us can't even imagine. Most of us can't imagine it anyway, but especially in that culture, this would have been a very difficult thing a very emotional thing. And in some sense, remember, Isaac is God's gift to Abraham and to Sarah, right? God gave Isaac to Abraham and Sarah, and now God seems to be taking him back. And this is, this is a painful thing, and we should hear this. There, there's a reason why this is painful, I believe. We're going to come back to that. So now, what happens is that Abraham, it says, he gets up the next morning and he, and he just goes, right? God says, I want you to sacrifice your son on the mountain that I'm going to tell you about. It's Mount Moriah. And you just go there and I'll show you and you'll sacrifice him. And it says, early in the morning, Abraham got up and loaded his and saddled his donkey and, and put all of his stuff, right? He just does it. Now, I often wondered, um, you know, does God, I mean, does Abraham tell Sarah about what he's going to do? Right? Is he like, sort of like, hey, you remember God who God told us, you know, he called us out and made us move. And then he promised us a kid. And then it took 15 or 20 years before we got the kid. And then we finally got the kid. Remember that God? Yeah. Well, he talked to me again yesterday. And I, you can imagine Sarah going, oh, every time, he, every time God talks to them, they have to do something crazy. Like it's just every time. And then she, he says, you know, I thought tomorrow maybe I'd get up and I'd take Abraham, I'd take Isaac with me and we'd go up and I'd just kill him on the mountain. What do you think? You know, like, how did that conversation go? Right, because every time God speaks to Abraham, something, something powerful, something monumental happens, right? Like, it's big. But he does. He obeys, right? He, he's, Abraham just obeys God. But remember, Abraham has had a long time at this point. This is towards the end of Abraham's life. But remember, Abraham has been journeying with God over the years. He's seen God provide. He's seen God do things, right? He's seen God keep his word. He, is, he has learned over the years to trust God. See, God doesn't give Abraham this immediately, right? This is, this is in, in some sense, this might be talking about testing. We might think about, about this as Abraham's final exam. Right, it's his final exam. Because it's towards the end of his life. And in fact, just a couple more chapters, Abraham dies. Right? This is at this is towards the end. This is his final exam. This is where his faith becomes mature. But remember, he has been journeying with God for a few decades now. Right? He has been doing this for a long time. And now his faith is matured in a way that allows him to be obedient. But it, the story is filled with. A little bit of intrigue, and I hope. And, and so, if you if you have your Bible right there with you, turn or just click on a, you know minimize this page and then click on your Bible app, right? But you can do, you. I want you to listen to. So he says, early the next morning, he got up and he loaded his donkey and he took with him two servants and his son Isaac. And when and he cut the wood because he was going to need wood to sacrifice him to make a sacrifice. He knew that, and he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, right? So it. It speeds up, right? Like we we just fast forward through the first three days, right? But it's on the third day. Uh, he looks up, he lifts his eyes, and he sees the place where God told him about. And and then he says to his servants, "Listen to what he says," because and you you'll you could easy to miss it. He says, "Stay here with the donkey." He's talking to the to the lads, right? He says, "Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there and worship." He says, "We will worship." And we will come back to you. Now, the writer of Hebrews looks at this and says, well, Abraham believed God, right? And, and Abraham believed that God could raise Isaac from the dead. And, and that's quite, I mean, that's certainly true. I mean, God can believe, you know, Abraham believed the, in, in who God was. But it's a little bit vague, right? Is Abraham telling them the truth? He says, we're going to go, we will go over there. We're going to worship and we will come back. Does he, is, is, it, is this just as Hebrew says, his, his faith that God's either not going to go through with it or that God would raise him from the dead if he does it? Or is Abraham being a little dishonest and saying, I, I don't want them to know. If they knew what I was going to go do, they'd stop me. Right? I don't know. But it's filled. But it's vague. There's a lot of vagaries here. The other thing is, is that, right, they, so Abraham, and, it, and it's going to say these two, this thing twice. It says, um, so they, uh, it says, 
uh, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and put it on Isaac's back because Abraham's older, so he's not going to carry this big load of firewood. He, and Isaac starts carrying it up the hill, and, and he takes the smaller things, the knife and the fire, right? And this is in uh, verse 6. And then it says, and the two of them went on together. And it's going to say that twice, same sentence twice. We're going to come back to that. And then Isaac eventually, having done this with his father many times, right? Because Isaac was right, this is the family business, right? The family business of being obedient to Yahweh, right? Abraham has taught Isaac how to sacrifice. And then he says, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, father? And he says, here I am, my son. This, this, yes, tell, talk to me. And, and Isaac says, look, we got the fire and we got the wood, right? That's, those are things we need for a sacrifice, for a burnt offering, right? He's like, because remember, Isaac's done this before. He says, but <laughs> we normally bring a lamb to this whole thing, right? We normally bring, there, there's got to be, we, we, we don't have anything to sacrifice. Are we going to find one when we get out there? And, and, and listen to what Abraham says. He says, God himself will provide the lamb, my son. Now, my old Hebrew professor, and, and much of this, his name is Danny Hayes, and I'm stealing much of this from him. Uh, but when you read this in Hebrew, he says, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Now, remember, there's no punctuation in Hebrew, right? There, it, it, my son can mean, you know, right? he's, he says, God's going to provide the lamb, and then he's talking to his son, right? An out of address. My son, I'm talking to you, my son. Or it could mean, God will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, and that lamb is my son, right? Like, and, and there's a little bit of agrees here, right? There's a little sort of intrigue. And so the question is, and it says, uh, and when they reached, uh, it says, when they reached the place that God told him about, Abraham built an offering. And so, but it says again in the second time, after he says, my, God will provide himself, will provide a lamb, it says, and they went on the two of them together. Now, many people, especially the rabbis in the ancient world, really didn't focus on Abraham as much as they focused on Isaac. Because Isaac is young and Abraham is old. Right? If Isaac doesn't want to be sacrificed, Isaac doesn't have to be, right? There's no way this 100-year-old man is going to overpower this young man, right? Even if he's a young teenager, even if he's nine, right? This 100-year-old man is probably not going to be able to overpower Isaac. It says the two of them went on together. I've got to wonder if Isaac was in on this, if Isaac kind of had an idea, right? Because Abraham's able to tie him up, right? This, this story, there's a lot of questions about this story. And you can use your imagination as you do, as you read it. But they went on together. They were in this together. And it says it twice, right? And in the Bible, when you see things repeated more than once, right? Like, it, that's not on accident. They were in this together, right? And Isaac goes with him. And Isaac allows himself to be bound, right? He says, when they reached the place God told him about, and this is verse 9, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. Now, have you ever noticed that in a good, like, you know, sort of suspenseful movie, right? The first part of the movie, you know, you can talk about days can just go by, weeks, months, years. It, it all goes by really quickly. But once the intense part, everything slows down, doesn't it? The music slows down, right? Or sometimes it speeds up or gets louder, but right, there's a mark, right? But then you're right. And so the first three days of this go by in one sentence, right? But then he's like, so he builds the altar and he binds Isaac, right? And he puts him on the altar and then he takes the, and he stretches out his hand. And you see, you can see this in a movie where everything's in detail and, and he go, raises his hand to, with the knife. And a, as he's about to plunge the knife into his son to kill his son and then set him on fire, right? All of this is happening. The angel, it says, but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. And he says, third time he said that, right? He said it when God says, Abraham. And he says, here I am. And he says, take your son. And then Isaac says, father. And he says, here I am. And then now he says the third time, here I am, right? The, the angel has spoken to him. He says, here I am. He says, do not lay a hand on the boy. In fact, don't do anything to him. Don't set him on fire. Don't do anything, right? He says, now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld your, from me your son, your only son, 
And then Abraham looked up and there was in the, caught in the thicket, right? And, and rams are not that stupid. I mean, they're not smart, but, but they're not that dumb that they just get caught all the time, right? God has clearly provided a lamb uh, or a ram. And he says, and he went over and took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Underline that in, instead of or highlight it or whatever you do. And God, and so Abraham calls that place, Yahweh provides, the Lord will provide. So now, this story on the surface is a story about God refining Abraham's faith, testing it, making sure that it is giving, giving Abraham his final exam, as it were. And there's a great deal we can learn about this, right? God, I mean, from the story itself, right, we realize that God's gifts are not ends in themselves. We are never to love the gift more than we love the giver. Never. In fact, Paul says in Romans 1 that that was the problem with human beings from the beginning. Is that human beings, right, instead of worshiping the creator, we worshiped created things, right? And we made, we made images that look like humans and birds and animals and all kinds of stuff, right? The problem is, is that we tend to focus on God's gifts rather than the God who gives them. Right? We tend to love, and, and so the, the problem is, is that blessings, right? and we said this before, accumulated blessings actually become curses right? because we begin to, we begin to hoard the blessings. We begin to, to love the gifts more than we love the giver. And that distorts the nature. right? So if there's anything that we love more than we love God, right? Abraham is more devoted to his God than he is devoted to his son. He's devoted more to, and not just his son, but he's devoted more to the God than the idea of his son, right? Than the, than the blessings that are going to flow through his son. He trusts God enough and loves God and is devoted to God enough to sacrifice all the gifts that God has given him, right? Because he believes in this good God. And so we, we can stop here and, and just sort of say, you know, and you could, you could ask yourself questions. Are there blessings, gifts, things in my life? And it don't just have to be inanimate things, right? In this one, it's people, right? Are there things in this life, people, relationships, 401ks, whatever it is, possessions, jobs, careers, reputation, or is there anything that we love and value more than we value and love and obey God? All right, and that's the question. That's the question that we hear asked, right? And, and so sometimes many of us go through periods in our lives where God pulls things away from us, right? Where God asks us to sacrifice those things. Why? Because he wants to refine our faith. And it's painful. Like, this is a painful thing that God has asked Abraham to do. This is, this, I mean, we, we sort of romanticize it. We can, and in some sense, that's what Hebrews does, right? Hebrews says, well, Moses, no, you know, Abraham was never really worried. I mean, and, and the writer of Hebrews is right about that. But the truth is that this is a painful thing that God is giving up. I mean, that, that Abraham is giving up, that God is asking Abraham to give up. And so today, as you are listening, I want to ask you, are there things in your life that you hold on to too tightly, right? Are there things that, you, that you're like, God, you can have this in my life and you can have this and you can have my money, you can have this, but you can't have this. There's this one little thing that's just all for me, right? And, and, I, and I can't let it go. It doesn't, maybe it's an identity. Maybe, like I said, it could be, a, it could be relationships. It could be uh, careers. It could be expectations. It could be plans. It could be whatever it is. I don't know what it is. You know what it is, but I don't know what it is. And you have to be willing to say, God, Everything I am and everything I have is yours. Because that's the essence of faith. It is this believing in this God, this good God. Now, let's talk about the struggle that we have. You're like, well, Lee, this God doesn't sound so good if he's asking me to give up. Right? How, how can this be good? Once again, Danny Hayes, when I was in college, we, we studied this passage pretty closely. And there's some startling similarities, right? And, and they begin with, you know, things that connect with Jesus, right? In Genesis 22, he says, I want you to take your son and go to the region of Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him there. Mount Moriah is the building spot of the temple 
It's the building spot. It's the place where they said, oh, well, this is where we need to build the temple. And, and the temple is right on the outskirts of town, and Jesus was crucified outside of town. And so Jesus, if he's not sacrificed on the exact same mountain, right, if he's not if one of the hills, right, this exact same hill, then it's one of the hills that is right around, right around this area. So in other words, it's, it's pretty close to the same place, right? Jesus and Isaac are in the same place. They're, they're, they're offered as sacrifices in the same place. And then, right, we say, listen to what he says. It says Jesus, that Abraham, right, um, took the wood for the burnt offering and put it on Jesus. Or I'm sorry, put it on Isaac, right? And Isaac carries the wood up the hill. And Jesus himself carries the wood up the hill, the wood for his own execution, right? He's going to do that. Right, and listen to the language, God says, take the son, take your son, your only one, the one you love. That language sounds familiar, right? John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, the only one, right? John's going to tell us that when the Holy Spirit comes down, he says, this is my beloved son. This is the son I love. Listen to him, right? When he goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? And they hear the voice from, uh, the voice from heaven. It says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. This is my son, the only one, the one I love, Jesus. Right? There's, there's startling connections to this story and to the story of Jesus. There's a story of a father sacrificing his son. And there's a story in the story of the New Testament, right? The story of Jesus is a story of a, son, of a father sacrificing his son. But here's, here's where the connection doesn't happen right? When, when Jesus, right, when Isaac goes up on the hill, God, you know, Abraham's about to, to, to kill his son, and he looks up, and there's the ram. And the ram is the substitute. But when God gets to, when Jesus gets to the top of the mountain, and when God looks at his son, there is no substitute, right? There's no substitute. Jesus is the substitute, Right? His death is the death that we, it belongs to, it rightfully belongs to us, and Jesus substitutes himself for us. Right? The death that, that he dies is, is, is justifiably our death. Right? When, when Jesus dies and, and God abandons him, right? he's forsaken, right? that, be, that belongs to us, but Jesus is the substitute. But I love what it says. Remember I told you that it says that they, the two of them went on together. Jesus is in on this. This is Jesus' choice. He chooses to be the substitute. So listen to what Paul says. Paul says in Romans 8, he says this, that God, right, the Father, who did not spare his own son. And that word spare is the same word, right? Remember when God says to Abraham, he says, you did not withhold your son from me, right? The Greek translation of the Old Testament uses this exact same word, right, that Paul picks up on. Paul's clearly connecting these two stories. He says, he who did not spare or withhold his own son, but gave him a first, how will he not also along with, along with him graciously give us all things? We could focus on we could we could focus on sort of deep theology, and, and and that's a great thing to do. But Paul has in mind the Christian life, right? Which which needs deep theology. We need to think deeply about this. But he also says, look, this God who did not withhold Jesus from us will give us everything that we need. Paul is in the midst of chapter eight. Is really it's about suffering. It's about how God is going to bring wholeness to this world. And he says, I know that some of you are struggling right now. But this father who loved us enough to give us his son, who did not withhold his son, he's going to give you everything you need. He's refining your faith. And this father loves you and is worthy of your worship and your trust and your obedience. Let's pray. Gracious father, we ask that as we look at your incomparable sacrifice, 
we see your heart in giving up your son for us for sacrificing your own son for us. You did not withhold him from us. So Father, we give you ourselves in return. We sacrifice, we offer ourselves to you as living sacrifices. Lord, we very often we have things in our lives that we love more than we love you and we serve more than we serve you. Lord, show us those things. Father, Point out those things. Test us and know us. And let us know ourselves so that we might serve you because we trust you, because you are good, because you love us. And we pray all of this in the name of the one who loved us and gave himself for us. And all God's people said together, amen. Thanks again for joining us in worship this morning. If you are new to us, we'd love to meet you in person at our Sunday services at 10 o'clock. We offer two styles of worship at that hour. Singing is led by our praise band in the sanctuary, while our choir leads a service with hymns and classical music in the chapel. We hope this has been a time of blessing and encouragement to you. And if you find yourself drawing closer to God and would like to know more about what it is to follow Christ, please reach out to one of us here at the church. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen.